Okay, so let's wrap up uh, aluminum alloys. Let's see. Okay, yeah, so we were, we left off talking about the 7000 series, and we basically said the ternary, the aluminum zinc mag, were medium strength, good weldability, such as uh, 7005, which used to be a really common alloy for bicycles and trains and things like that. It's been uh, superseded by some uh, newer alloys now, and we pointed out that there is a critical ratio of zinc to mag that where we uh, have the best uh, um, uh, stress corrosion cracking resistance. And then I pointed out that most commercial alloys that we use actually don't fall into this this ratio and instead we use modified heat treatment procedures to increase this resistance um, and so I sort of realized there I got this statement in here decreases differences in electrode potentials throughout the microstructure and I sort of glossed over that but what does anyone have any idea what I meant what I meant there as I was sort of re revising, or as this might, it's yeah, self self corrode, right? So you've got particles in there, right? Particles are different composition, right? So you can have galvan galvanic corrosion between the reinforcing particles in the matrix, right? Um, and then we talked about this duplex heat treatment, uh, T73. And we talked a lot, remember back in the, the first lecture of aluminum, or the first set of notes, we talked a lot about why we um, sometimes need these duplex heat treatments, right? About uh, uh, getting a homogeneous, uh, Nucleation of GP zones followed by uh, nucleation of the uh, reinforcing phase that we want. And this is just an example of, of one that is uh, um, commercially important, right? Then we had mentioned that the quaternary aluminum, zinc, mag, copper based alloys have incredible response to. Uh, <coughs> to uh, age hardening, but there, the big problem again is then with uh, stress corrosion cracking or depending on how it was even quench cracking. So these were moved to things like boiling water quenches and complicated temperings like this T73, right? And this is sort of, I would say the archetypical example of what I mean by this these duplex heat treatments, right? So here we hold at roughly 120 C for almost a full day, right? To nucleate a uh, uh, GP zones, right? <coughs> From which then we can get a refined dispersion of, depending on the alloy, either the intermediate eta prime or the thermodynamically stable eta phase. Right, and if we compare that to, uh, this gives us a good combination of high strength plus a much better uh, resistance to stress corrosion cracking than if we just did a single age at 120 or if we age at the higher temperature of 160 to 170, we get um, not as high of a yield strength but uh, again, better resistance to, to uh, stress corrosion effect. So this T73 heat treatment is a really important commercial application of the uh, thermodynamics of uh, uh, nucleation and growth that we've spent a lot of time talking about. And this was used to great success in the 70s to produce 
very large forged pieces. Uh, like for example, this DC 10 uh, structural numbers. So since then there's been some scattered improvements. Uh, mostly because uh, this T73 temper, while it's great for corrosion, it gives us a weight increase, right? Why are we getting a weight increase? Okay. So weight increase means we need more, more metal. Why would we need more, right? Our strength is 15% less than if it was used in the uh, just the single the single aged uh, case. So fifteen percent might not sound like a lot, but what do we have to consider with design? Right. Do we design to the actual strength? No, right. We've got fairly large safety factors in there, right? So that 15% difference gets multiplied by the safety factor, right? And that's how much, approximately, right? Because its strength is not linear. But that's approximately how much more material we need, right? So if we have a safety factor of three, that's a very significant, right? Uh, extra amount of material, right? Granted, we don't actually, right? That's, that's highly schematic, right? It's not one-to-one, -one, nearly close to one-to-one -one like that. Um, because it's going to scale by stress, it's going to scale by cross sectional area, right? Area goes by the amount squared. So, <clears throat> but just just uh, sort of pointing out that small changes, small but not insignificant changes in the properties, could give you drastic uh, uh, changes to your to your design. So. Um, the focus since that point has been the development of, of focusing on maintaining the strength but improving the corrosion resistance, right? And so uh, this has been done by adding small amounts of silver, right, which, is, which modifies the precipitation sequence, right? We can... Uh, Increase uh, um, copper and rely on variations of the duplex heat treatment. Remember, copper typically is not something we add to reduce susceptibility to corrosion. Right? That usually has the opposite effect. But with some clever heat treatments, uh, people, have been, people have been able to do it. Reduce the levels of silicon and iron. You'll notice a pattern here, right? In all of these alloy systems we talk about, reduce, right? For some properties, we want to reduce silicon and iron. For other things, we want to increase, right? Remember, iron is pernicious. It's an impurity that we can't get out. So for alloys that we want to reduce the iron, requires careful processing, and that jacks the price of these, these up. So reducing the levels of silicon and iron, right, reduces our coarse intermetallics, which gives us, uh, since those are less likely to crack and nucleate macroscopic cracks in our material, right, it gives us uh, better uh, K1C, but severely, in severely increase our cost, right, and then, uh, 750 and 710 add some zirconium, right, which retards recrystallization. Um, and with, uh, again, alloy development is magic pixie dust up here. These particular alloys, we could lower the, uh, get lower, lower quench rates, quench, quench rates, right? So again, I don't expect anyone to memorize these alloys and what this, right? But just have a sense of what the general strategies that we can use to sort of alter properties, right? Yeah. I'm 
Uh, yeah, so if we go back here, right, our strength is still lower, right? We have about a 15% a lower strength from the T73 temper than if we just did a single age to peak aging at 120, right? And so that 15% decrease in strength means we need more material, right? To get the same, to handle the same match to the same loads, right? And because we have safety factors in there, the amount of extra material we need is multiplied, right? So in that case, we have a modest change in the strength that gives us a, a fairly significant change when we're talking in, in the overall weight when we're talking about really huge pieces, right? Okay, so what I do, one thing I do want to point out about 7,000 series is remember what the uh, stress corrosion uh, cracking response of 2,000 series alloys were. So in this case, let me, uh, let's, let's try and see what we can do with interpreting this graph a little bit. Uh, uh, in a little bit more detail here, right? So this axis is the crack velocity, right? This axis is our stress intensity factor, right? So what what is our stress intensity telling us here? All right, when we plot it like this, right? This tells us our resistance to crack formation, right? And this is our crack uh, growth rate. So what it's saying is the 2000 series alloys, once we have a crack, they're all going to go in the same, grow at about the same rate. Right? So what we want to do is order these by how resistant they are to getting the, to developing a crack uh, in the first place. Right? So that's how we rank our, rank these alloys. 7,000 series is a drastically different picture. In this case, this plateau is quite dramatic, right? So what we have is a three order of magnitude, four order of magnitude difference in the rate of that the cracks grow, right? So we have to think about design here uh, um, in a, in, in a bit, or in a slightly different way. Rather than improving, in 7000 series, rather than improving stress corrosion cracking by increasing the stress amplitude, that, right, the stress that the material can see, what we do is we've improved how fast we've really retarded the crack growth rate once it's, once it's there, right? So for either fatigue or stress corrosion cracking, we can either design from a point of view that we're going to have cracks, right? So let's just keep them from growing to catastrophic levels, right? Or we can design so that the uh, we it, it's more difficult to nucleate the cracks in the third place. In the 2000 series, that was the strategy that we had to take in the 7000 series, we were, we were really focused on pushing down the amount of uh, uh, the growth rate of the crack. Okay, so on to that's like my nervous tick. I was looking over old videos, and I noticed every time there's a transition, I'm like, I say, okay, sort of hopefully it doesn't annoy you as much as it annoys me when I. <coughs> Uh, when I go back and look at it. So aluminum, lithium, we talked about two primary advantages when we talked about this series sort of as a whole, right? Lower density, we can decrease weight by about 10%, right? For the same, uh, for the same volume. And we can increase uh, stiffness. Right? So, 
why do we care about Young's modulus so much? Right? Decreased density is really obvious, right? If we want to have alloys that fly, right? The, the lighter the plane, the less fuel you have to use, right? Or the less, the lighter your car, the less gas it uses. Why do we care so much about stiffness? The yield strength is improved. Is the yield strength directly related? It, it, it sort of is in the sense that uh, we typically say take the 2%, the 0.2% offset strain as our, as our macroscopic yield, right? So we do have a, if you just think about if that holds, right, then we will have a increase in yield for a stiffer material, but that's not necessarily the primary reason. Yeah. What you say vibration? Right? Yeah, so we've got uh, um, potentially to uh, reduce vibration. I didn't think about that. I don't know if that, right? Because typically the stiffer it is, the higher the frequency it's gonna vibrate at, right? So I don't know what the dampening is. Uh, hmm. I'd have to think about that. But what is what is stiffness, right? It's the relationship of stress to strain, right? So you have higher under larger loads, you have greater dimensional stability, right? If you have uh, um, right, if things are bolted in place, you have less movement that's going to affect. Uh, other structures uh, around it for, for the same for the same loads, right? Coupled with the fact that you have uh, generally these tend to be the strongest aluminum alloys that we have. Uh, uh, it gives us uh, big advantages and these. Same problems, right? I sound like a broken record. High strength, right? <laughs> low ductility and low toughness. Right. So again, this is due to uh, severe strain localization from cutting the uh, coherent particles that we use for strengthening. Right. Looking back on the notes, you know, I have a statement in there that says, you know, the general trend is that the um, the more that we are reliant on particle strengthening to, or, or agent precipitation hardening to give us our strength, the worse our toughness and our fatigue resistance is going to be, right? And all of these alloys, right, you see this trend play out again and again and again and again, right? And it's something I... I said, but I, as as I was reviewing, I felt I think I should probably sort of reiterate that point. So we end up with uh, uh, cracking, and so the focus uh, on developing aluminum lithium alloys is we want to form additional precipitates that are. Uh, promote uh, homogen ho homogeneous deformation, right? So precipitates that are not so easily cut, right? That are going to give us a, 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 um, a better dispersion of slip, right? And so remember, right, as we shear these particles, right, we're created a weak spot, right? So under fatigue, when we're ratcheting our stress, uh, ratcheting, right, we're gonna keep slipping on those same slip systems leading to slip bands, right? That, that where those, uh, those particles have, have already sheared. Okay. So the general uh, approach both with lithium and copper is we want to add, uh, by adding these alloying elements, we want to reduce the solubility of lithium in aluminum. 
which gives us a higher volume fraction of the strengthening phase and other particles that that come out right plus if with copper we also get uh, <coughs> GP zones and the, the theta double prime phase that we use to strengthen the 2000 series alloys. Um, right, at low copper concentrations, we get this intermetallic T1 phase plus the delta prime, but this is not particularly useful in uh, dispersing slip, so we need to go to slightly higher copper concentrations. Aluminum, lithium, mag, magnesium also reduces the solubility of lithium, right? And so what, it, and what these alloy families do is these are the ones that allow us to maximize the volume fraction of our reinforcing phase for a given concentration of uh, lithium. Then we get the benefit of solid solution strengthening from the magnesium. Right, and of course, right, we can get good strengthening phases, but then of course, we always have our adverse effect on ductility of all these of all these particles. Okay. Aluminum, lithium, copper bag, right? It's basically the same thing, except now. Right, people, we say copper is good, magnesium is good, why not both? All right, let's try it out. This is how alloy development comes about. This is why we have alloys with 16, 16 elements in them because we say, oh, these four work really well doing this, these four work really well doing this. If we put them together and have the eight, maybe those effects will be multiplied or maybe they'll do something different that we didn't expect. Right. But basically, the aluminum uh, mag, we get this co complicated co-precipitation of multiple phases, right? And the important one is this S phase aluminum uh, two copper magnesium that is very hard and uh, is not cut by dislocations, right? So at even relatively small sizes, uh, we loop. And so we have more, more homogeneous. Uh, uh, slip, right? The aging sequence of this is the processing sequences of these are quite complicated. I put this in here not because I expect you to to memorize this or even really care about the specific order, but just to know that in the more advanced alloys, generally the processing gets complicated. We have the alpha phase, we cold work, then we solution heat treat and quench to get these different phases out, so we're relying on heterogeneous nucleation of grain boundaries and dislocations to develop some of these, these phases. So it becomes, the processing becomes very specific, very complicated, and very specific to the, to the individual um, uh, alloys. Some things of note, is zirconium and sometimes titanium um, give us uh, an interesting behavior. So if we add uh, small amounts of zirconium, this, if you look at the phase diagram between aluminum and zirconium, it's basically line compounds, right? So the zirconium wants to come out really badly. So what we do is we get this, uh, we get a very refined dispersion of, of Al3Zr intermetallic from which the strengthening phase that we, that one of the strengthening phases we want to build prime will heteronucleate uh, on it um, and actually wet the surface, right? So you now have these particles that are not a single compound, but are these, are themselves, uh, Composites, right? So this is sort of just a list of some important commercial alloys. These are all basically aerospace alloys. Um, aluminum, lithium, copper was one of the uh, the earliest. 
right? And here we can see the general um, uh, trends. And so notice, right, our damage tolerant alloys, our strengths are basically that of about 2024, but our ductility is half, and our fracture toughness is still slightly less, right? And this is our damage tolerant, right? So this tells us the fact that we're using this over the 2000 series means that that 10% reduction in density is critical in the design, right? Because why would you use an alloy that costs a lot more because of the lithium content rather than aluminum copper, right? That still has worse properties than the current, right? It's all about, it's all about the density there. But look at this the general trend with, with high strength, right? As we move up in strength, our, yeah, our yield stress and ultimate tensile strength increase, but our elongation and fracture toughness take a nosedive, right? Okay. So the last bit I want to talk about are uh, casting alloys. All right, and this is a fairly short section in speaking about particular alloys because um, there's uh, oh it's on the on the next page. Basically, the only ones that we care about are aluminum, silicon, copper. Those are the ones that are are uh, used uh, for virtually everything. Uh, everything structural, right? The issue with uh, cast alloys, right, is uh, again, fatigue, right? And so our primary uses for cast aluminum is automotive, right? The big thing is uh, engine blocks, Right, we can replace cast iron engine blocks with aluminum and save a, a really good a really good chunk of weight. Right, so in a reciprocating engine, right, we have to worry about fatigue, and we actually have two types of fatigue that we need to worry about. Right, the most obvious is high cycle fatigue. Right, we've got uh, an engine with rotating parts. Right, and if we think about a diesel engine that's sort of chugging along at 2,000 RPM over 10,000 uh, driving hours, right, where we could be approaching, you know, 10, as much as 10 to the 10 cycles uh, over the service life of a diesel engine, right? Remember, these things are on the roads for potentially millions of miles. Uh, and then we have low cycle fatigue issues, which is basically resulting from shutting the engine off and starting it back on because now we have thermal loads, right? So we are, we've got uh, thermal stresses, uh, thermal stress cycles acting on it rather than mechanical stress cycles. For aerospace, a lot of landing gear uh, castings and wheels, automotive wheels now as well. Um, So the designations for cast alloys are just a little bit different than those of uh, wrought aluminum, right? So 6,000 series is un unused, or I should, I should start at the top. So the form is, is uh, the 100 series with the dot and an X, right? So, these, the um, alloying elements are the same with the exception of 6,000 is it used. And uh, so the first one, just like in the work cast for the raw alloys, gives us the uh, primary alloying elements. The second and third give us a purity, right? And then the, the after the decimal place gives is the final, uh, the final form, uh, final product form 
Now, remember in the the wrought alloys, the last digits were like a just this alloy serial number, right? There was nothing um, specifically. Uh, uh, there, there was no. The second digit just told you what else it was like, right? So. Uh, 2024 was a derivative of 2017, right? But the last two that did didn't mean anything. Here they indicate uh, a purity uh, level. So for this class, the only thing we're going to care about is the uh, three th the 300 uh, series, right? And this is basically everything that's used is in this uh, series with, there's a couple, right? Cheaper things tend to be 4,000, like mini blinds, right? Just the silicon. Uh, and some 2,000 series, but the huge bulk is, is three. So let's take a look at sort of a, a modern uh, alloy is 319. Right. So seven percent silicon, three and a half percent copper, and less than one percent magnesium. Right. So if if this picture is sort of the only thing we you take away from the cast series, cast discussion, well I shouldn't say that. This is one of the primary things I'd like you to take away. This our discussion on past, right? Is that the microstructure looks significantly different than what we see in the wrought alloys, right? These are solidified alloys, right? This is poured from melt and solidified. We don't go through all the um, the processing steps of, of cold work and recrystallization to give us a nice refined grain structure, right? This is two hundred microns here. And what do we see? Well, this is a largely a dendritic structure, right? And these here are secondary dendrite arms. Dendrites, looking at dendritic microstructures is sort of a talent. Remember, we've got these like the structure of a dendrite in 3D, right? But there's not necessarily a preferential, right? The growth follows things like thermal. Uh, uh, gradients of the primary dendrites and then the secondary dendrite arms are coming off. And so you've got this complicated dendritic shape in 3D, then we're taking a random slice through it in 2D. Right? So again, it's very hard to picture the full the three, to reconstruct sort of the 3D what this looks like in 3D from the 2D. Right? The important bit Important character, uh, microstructure characterization is really this secondary dendrite arm spacing that gets tied back to our properties. Right. So in this case, we have uh, um, alpha aluminum uh, dendrites cores, and then all of these intermetallic phases. So eutectic uh, silicon, right? So if we have, uh, all right, and then we've got over here, the contrast isn't so great, but you see this really weird phase structure here. This is a aluminum, iron, manganese, silicon intermetallic, and there's tons of these intermetallics uh, that can form. Okay, so iron's not in the, the alloy specification, why is it still here? Right? The answer is it's very difficult to get rid of. Right? It's, it's an impurity. So cast alloys, especially if we're doing uh, waste stream recycling, uh, we have to think carefully about how, how about how we either manage the waste stream to minimize iron or if you just do a Google search, iron and aluminum removal, there are 
hundreds and hundreds of patents of scrubbing technologies, different things you can attempt to do to try and get rid of them. And basically the long and short of it is, is most of them don't work very well or only work in specific applications. So the cooling rate of this, the solidification time, is going to have a really profound effect on the microstructure. So both of these are at the same magnification. This is a 50 micron scale bar, right? And notice that the secondary uh, dendrite arm spacing is quite a bit different. And the uh, refinement of the tectic silicon, right? The dispersion of that in the material is quite different, right? And why is this important? Well, we'll talk about shrinkage, right? And porosity, but all, right, these, these are strongly affected by the, uh, the dendrite arm space, right? Which is a direct function of the, of the solidification rate. So, Let's take a, we can just take a look at that with respect to properties. Right. So here we've got a slowly solidified sample. Here we have a uh, uh, one that is cooled much more quickly. And so notice the initial strength, the initial yield strength is quite a bit higher in the rapidly, more rapidly solidified uh, material, right? And that's, right, our length scale of the secondary dendrite arms is fine, right? So what does that mean? Our effective slip lengths, right? You can think about that as sort of like a hall patch type relationship, right? Our dislocations have a shorter distance to go before they run into that messy obstacles of, of eutectic uh, silicon. But notice, they, uh, right, it's a aluminum, copper, silicon, so it's going to age, right? And it ages differently based on the uh, the different uh, heating rates, right? So. We've got two mechanisms going on here, right? We've got solid solution strengthening um, and the evolution of the, uh, the phase, right? So if we, there's a trade off here, right? As we nucleate more precipitates, Right, we reduce our solid solution strengthening effect. Right, right. and the more primary, the slower we cool it. Right, the the larger the primary regions are, the lar the larger fractions of the dendrite regions. Right we have less copper available um, in the other regions of the structure to give us, to give us uh, strengthening. So this solidification like, indirectly influences strength. But if we look at you know, heat treatment at various temperatures, this pretty much mirrors what we see in the uh, rock alloys. So the delta, uh, the theta prime phase. So uh, Tate certainly asked about heterogeneous nucleation on dislocations because I brought it up several times and I, I didn't show any examples. I showed lots of pictures of nucleation at grain boundaries or at other particles. Um, but I had mentioned uh, dislocations as places for heterogeneous nucleation. Um, and right here's an example of that. Right, this is 
nucleation of uh, theta prime at the earliest stages of, of aging, right, you can see it's growing basically on the uh, dislocations. And then as we age for longer, right, it's cut off on the screen a little bit, but this is uh, one hour, three hours, five hours, all the way up to, to 50 hours, right? And you see we get the needle-like, plate-like precipitates of the theta prime, right, forming from, uh, first from dislocations and then on, on uh, growing on GP zones of copper, right? And we get nice, uh, really nice precipitate structures. So if we look at the uh, the curve, the, the what's happening with our yield strength here, we can break it up into a couple different contributions. Right? The first is just the intrinsic strength of the aluminum by itself. Right? We have a solid solution strength in phase that as precipitates grow, we lose concentration to the precipitates, so our solid solution component dies off, but our precipitates will then grow until we hit peak aging and then over aging, right? And so the, our actual total strength is a combination of, uh, of all of these, right? So it's really, uh, it mimics what we see in the wrought alloys uh, quite a bit. The big problem with cast, though, is generally with cast, we're using these big solid pieces, right? When we talk about wrought alloys, we've talked about a lot about extrusions in 6,000, right? So fairly thin walls or rolled sheet, right? So fairly, again, fairly thin, thin pieces, or we talked about things like cooking utensils where we really didn't care about uh, things like dimensional stability. But when you've got a big honking engine block, uh, dimensional stability becomes important. Right. Anytime you have something bolted in place and then it grows or shrinks from either thermal or microstructure changes, right, that imparts huge load, potentially huge loads on the neighboring, on itself and on the neighboring things that it's, it's bolted to. Okay. So why, what's going on with, uh, with these alloys. So I've got two cases here. We'll call peak aged and over aged. It's basically two different tempers. Remember the T7 temper is uh, stabilized, meaning that it's given a short high temperature heat treatment to exhaust, uh, um, exhaust strengthening. So if we hold this at 100 C, not much happens for a long time, right? At 180, right, as we hold it over time, it grows. At 250, it grows and then shrinks again. So what the heck is, is going on here, right? So as GP zones grow, we reduce copper from the solid solution. That gives us a small change in the lattice parameter, sort of a negligible effect, right? But as we precipitate theta prime, remember all these intermediate phases are, are much more complicated structures, right? They're not close packed, right? They're more open structures, right? So we get uh, a growth, right, as we go from theta prime. Then as we nucleate and grow our theta phase, 
remember theta was that nice ordered intermetallic structure, so a more closed, more close packed structure than the other intermediate phases, we start to shrink again. Right? Whereas the the overage case, right, you basically stay stay where we are. So if we take a look at it, this is uh, the dimensional growth at one, what was the temperature on the previous slide? One, 250, 250C, right, for different uh, tempers, right? So under T4, solution heat treat, and naturally aged. So during this full service, we have further precipitation of the theta prime phase. So we have dimensional growth basically over the whole whole life. T6, we solution heat treatment artificially aged. So to, to a peak age, near a peak age state. So we do get some further growth of the theta prime, but then followed by the formation of, of theta. And then at T7, we have no uh, additional precipitation of the theta prime. We have uh, growth of the, of the theta phase, right? So again, why is this important? Because we, any under constraints, this is going to give us uh, uh, lows. Oh no, what happened to my, I it got out of order, okay. So this is just an example uh, of this. So this is um, simulations that show the uh, uh, growth in different parts of the uh, of a, a complicated engine block. This is a, a V8 engine block, right? At different points, and the simulation numbers sort of. Uh, match those previous curves uh, uh, fairly fairly nicely, right? But you can see that you've got gradients in temperature, right? This is going to give us gradients in these microstructure changes, which is going to give us fairly large internal residual stress gradients, right? Which could lead to uh, uh, all sorts of problems, right? you're much more likely to uh, crack a block when there are large residual stresses than when, when there's not. Okay. So uh, fatigue, we've got pores, right? So what do you think fatigue like is gonna be like in these? Right, pretty bad, right? We've got a, a, a huge amount of previously existing cracks, right? You can think of the... Uh, uh, pores, right? We get huge amounts of of shrinkage, right? Compared to other systems, right? Six six and a half percent in these aluminum alloys versus three percent for titanium, four percent for ink and L castings. So that big degree of shrinkage means we're going to have lots of uh, exacerbate the porosity. Right, and one way to get around that is uh, to hip, right, hot, hot isostatic pressing, right? So basically we put it under high temperatures and very high pressures to seal up these pores, right? So get rid of our pre-existing cracks. Right? And we get a very a big improvement in the uh, fatigue life. Okay, so not hipping the the temper has a huge effect on the fatigue strength as well. All right, so if we look at T7 versus the T6, we see that the uh, for a given 
stress level, the number of cycles to failure for T6 is much, is much higher, right? And the difference here, and again, this is not in the uh, uh, tip state, right? So it's not the small crack growth rate. Those are basically both the same. But the, the, the dispersion of these precipitates, right? 50 nanometers apart versus 300 nanometers apart, right? So obviously, if the volume fraction is the same, these have to be larger precipitates spaced farther apart, right? So uh, we can get dislocation pileups of these large um, particles and get stress concentrations leading to the fracture of the uh, uh, intermetallic intermetallic phases. Okay. And then the last, very last bit, I actually managed to finish, great. Right, we've got two types of uh, fatigue. We're talking about low cycle and high cycle. But for the low cycle fatigue, this thermal mechanical fatigue, um, we have basically what we call in phase and, and, uh, and out of phase, right? So this out of phase is our, when our high, when we have high stresses at low temperatures, right? Followed by uh, creep at elevated temperature in, in compression, right? So you can imagine, um, something is fixed in place when it's warm, right? And then when it cools down, it's gonna be under a high tension, high, high tensile load. And when you have uh, this, you, you tend to, to have transgranular fracture. When we're in phase, when we have high tensile stresses at high temperatures, we get creep at elevated temp, uh, uh, temperature and tension rather than compression. And then we get intragranular fracture and cracks that form into the affected particles. So it's also not just the structure, but it's also the, the nature of the complex loading that's happening on the part that's also going to give you the way. So when you're de designing cast parts, you have to take all of this into account. You got to take the service temperature, the loads it's going to see, the alloy, um, all of that. So this wraps up aluminum. Monday will be a review session. Wednesday we'll do our introduction to steel, and then Friday's the exam. Okay. See you next week. <laughs>